Button. And of course, the portrait of Jesus in Matthew is King of the Jews. And today, we must understand the rejection of the King. Before we read the chapter, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we need your help today. We need your help to turn from depending and caring and living for ourselves and what other people think of us and how they perceive us to living and caring and letting Jesus do the things that He wants to do in our life. And Lord, it's easy to say, but it's, it's a struggle in our lives to do. He was God and man. And He understands how weak we are, how frail we are, how little our wisdom is, how little our power and our strength. Oh Lord, be our strength today, we pray. We know that You are the God of all supply. And so in this matter of dealing with the rejection of truth, we pray that we may have Your strength to believe what You have said and not to yield from that at all. Help us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. What is man's greatest fear? Someone did a poll of this a few years back, and it will surprise you what man is most afraid of. People are most afraid of speaking. And I think the reason that is, is because man's greatest fear is that he will be rejected. All of us want to be loved. All of us want to be appreciated how wonderful that is in life to have somebody that cares about you. Somebody that thinks you're special. Somebody that thinks your life has value and importance. And so we are afraid. We are afraid that other people will not view us in that way. I want to tell you today, this thing of self-esteem, we've got the thing all mixed up. We think that self-esteem comes from the encouragement of others, and that is not bad. We certainly ought to encourage our children. We certainly ought to appreciate and praise them when we have a chance to. We certainly ought to try to build people up. But I want to tell you that a person's self-worth is viewed in the fact that he knows that, that, that God loves him, that he's not rejected by God. And if you were saved, if you had been bought by the most precious thing in all the universe, the sacrifice and blood and suffering of God the Son, you know that you have worth that will never fade away. Whatever men think of you, and men do not matter, God matters. And God attributes worth, eternal worth to those that will trust and believe and receive His Son. And that will help you to do what's right in a world that rejects good and truth and justice. And the king knows. 
If anybody knows about rejection, the king knows. And something is happening as we go towards Matthew 13. And before we get there, and even now in 11, we're going to see that even though the king did miracles and multitudes pressed him every day to be blessed and helped or to see what he would do, or the Pharisees was there to try to trick him and catch him or trap him or find fault with him or somehow... And they were measuring the opinions of men and the, the uh, appeal of the crowd. And they were all there, pressing around Jesus. And he could have been very much encouraged. He had a lot of people. He had a lot of support. He was doing great things. He had the power of God. But Jesus, the King, knew something. He knew that his kingdom was being rejected on the inside of most people's hearts. He knew that his nation was not going to receive him and his spiritual kingdom. They weren't going to have him. They weren't interested in that. They were interested in being fed and they were interested in being helped and they were interested in somebody that could take care of all of their problems, but they were not interested in changing the sin that was on the inside of their heart. And the king knew. He knew that they would and were rejecting him as king. We live in a day when if you're a Christian, you may be the only one at the place where you were. You may be the only one that knows some lost people. You may be the only Christian that they know. And I tell you that because God loves us and He will never forsake us or leave us, even when we deserve uh, His disapproval and His correction in our life, that His relationship to us is sealed forever through the blood of the cross and the work of His Son. That because that is true, we can stand with Him in this world and bear the rejection of men. Sometimes the old saying is, me and God are a majority. Well, God is a majority by Himself, you see. It doesn't take one plus God. It just takes God. And if we have His approval, then what does it matter if all the world would reject us? I want to say to you today what this passage says to me. What the king was trying to communicate to his disciples and those people around him that were rejecting his message. You... You must understand the rejection of the king. You must understand that. What happened here. What was taking place here. You must look at it and see the messages that are here. You must understand the rejection of the king. Because even his friends wandered. Now, I don't think they rejected him. And you have this passage about John the Baptist here. And I'm not saying that John the Baptist didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Certainly he did. God had told him that and revealed that to him. And he had seen the signs and wonders and he was a testimony to that. But John the Baptist was in prison here and he had gotten thrown in jail because he spoke against Herod's evil lifestyle and taking his brother's wife. And, and John was discouraged here. He was discouraged. And so he, he, he sent a messenger from prison and, and uh, he asked Jesus, are you the Messiah that we're looking for or should we look for another? And Jesus in verse 4 said, go tell John that the, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk and leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear and, and the poor have the gospel preached unto him. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. This is a quote from Isaiah and the prophets that this would be the work and ministry of the Messiah. And John would know that. And so Jesus used scripture to help his discouraged and doubting friend. 
And he goes on to say that John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets. And, and that John the Baptist was the forerunner of the king and gave the message of the king and, and prepared the way of the king in verse 10. And, and one is not greater in the Old Testament era and scheme than John the Baptist. But even John the Baptist was in a period of doubt. And Jesus said, I want to reassure you, friend. I want to reassure you by the Word of God and you can come back to, to, to believing again with all your heart and never give it a moment's doubt that I am the Messiah here. And sometimes Christians will be the ones to reject the truth around you. Sometimes preachers preach that which is not in agreement with the Word of God. They may think they are right. They may believe that they are right. Much of what we teach and preach in, in churches today is not based on the truth of the Scripture. It's based on psychology. It's based on some misinterpretation that has been passed down from people to people to people and some misunderstanding of what the Word of God really says. And sometimes friends can have it all wrong. And even friends of the King. And you need to understand that that may happen from time to time. And we need to search out what the truth is on the basis of Scripture and believe that. And, and so Jesus reassured John in verses 1 through 19. And at the end of this passage, he talks about, he talks about how the nation has uh, reacted to the preaching of John and the, the preaching of others. In verse 16, he says, But whereunto I shall liken this generation. It's like children sitting in the marketplace calling to their fellows, saying, We have piped unto you, and you have not danced. We have mo uh, mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. John came eat, not eating and drinking, and you say, He has a demon. And I came eating and drinking with publicans and sinners, and you say he's a glut and a wine bibber, and that wisdom is justified by his children. In other words, a person sometimes believes what they want to believe instead of what's in front of them. And Jesus said, you've rejected both me and John. John's ministry, as he came to say, the kingdom is here and it's coming, and and the king is here, and here's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You said he, he has a demon because he, he, he comes from the wilderness, and he, he doesn't uh, socialize. And, and then you say of the Son of Man, the king, that, that he's a glutton and a wine bibber because he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Rejection. Rejection. And in 16 through 24, we see this message rejected. Rejected by the nation. And then in 20, he begins to talk to the towns where his miracles were done. He begins to say in verse 20, he began to upbraid the cities in which most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe to thee, Chorazin and Bethsaida. For the mighty works which were done in thee had been done in Tyre and Sidon. They were repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And woe unto thee, Capernaum, if what had been done in thee had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah. They would have repented and they're going to be able to rise up in judgment against the evidence that was given to you. His message is rejected by the nation. It's rejected by His people. It's rejected by the Jews and they have been given light and privilege and, and messengers and John has come and, and had great power and influence and Jesus came and did great miracles and they saw it all and yet they would not receive the truth. They would not receive it. And as his nature, nation rejects him, we see he turns to the individual in 25 through 30. He has a new message here. And from this point on, in the Gospels of Matthew and other Gospels, he starts talking about the cross instead of the kingdom. 
Oh, He still does miracles that show who He is. He still helps people. He still preaches. But He begins to talk about the cross and He begins to deal in a different way. And He talks about the mysteries of the kingdom. And here, the message is turned from the nation to any individual who will receive it. Let's read 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father of heaven and earth, because thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight, for all things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but by the Father, and neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus said that God, because of the rejection of men, has hidden these things from their eyes. And He's going to turn to those individuals who will be like little children and believe what is clearly and evident in front of them. To have faith in the Son of God. And so the invitation is given. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. To the individual. To the individual. To you. And here is your invitation today. Here is something in, in this gospel that presents Jesus as King of the Jews. Here's something for you. Here's an invitation for you. When do you rest? God created the earth in six days and then He rested. You rest when the work gets done. And be careful to understand what Jesus offers you in salvation. And be careful to understand what Jesus offers you in your Christian life. He offers you the cross as the payment for your sin. The work for salvation has been done. You don't have to work to get to heaven. You don't have to be good enough today. You don't have to be religious to get it. You don't have to achieve great things to get it. You don't have to crawl up uh, steps on your knees or, or crawl down a road on a pilgrimage until they're bloody to show the sorrow of your sin. You have to believe in Jesus and the work that He did in your place. And you can have it. It's free. It's a gift. And Jesus offers rest and salvation to any that are burdened down with their sin and their care and their need. And then He offers that rest to you in your Christian life. If you've listened to me much at all, you know that this is an important thing in my thinking anyway, in my emphasis. I am so disturbed that in fundamental churches we have the idea that by our efforts and our faithfulness and our goodness and our strength and our abilities that we can achieve what God wants. You cannot. You cannot. And the life that Jesus offers you the thing that He wants for you is not a, a life sitting on the sidelines in activity, but it is a life where He produces the things in your life. Is that the way we live? Do we get up in the morning and honestly and consciously say to Jesus, okay, Jesus, here's the day, it's yours. 
I do not want any decision here that you do not want to make. I do not want to go any place that you do not want me to go. I want to go to the people that you want to help. I want you to put the problems and the hardships into this day that are good for me, that I can learn from, that will help someone else. I want you to control that. In fact, I cannot control it. I am going to trust you for today and tomorrow and for all of my life. I am going to trust you to live through me and do the things that you want done. Yes, I know that I do them with you. I know that I must speak that word. I know that I must pray that prayer. I know that I must reject that evil and that sin in me and around me. But I want it to be you that is doing it and not coming from the abilities of the old man and me. I want it to be you. And we say we love Jesus. But do we really live that way letting Him control all of our life? Letting Him take care of all of the problems. Letting Him give us the joy and the pleasure that we really need. I think we don't. I think too often we decide what we want and what we think is best and, and what we think our children need and what we want to see them do and be and we try to make all of that happen ourselves. And that is not rest. Rest is what happens when the work is done. And in Hebrews, it is, there is offered to those that labor a place of rest that they can enter into. And that rest is Jesus. And the nation may reject the King of Kings. And friends around you may reject the King of Kings. And people at your church may reject God's will in their life and say we've got to do it and we need to be busy doing this and that and the other and we need to be faithful and I believe we do need to be faithful and we need to learn what God wants and I believe we need to learn what God wants. I just know that Jesus has to do the work and we can't do it. But understand, understand His invitation he takes the burden. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. Put your burden on me. You'll find that, that my life and my responsibilities aren't heavy because why is it? You say living for Christ is hard. Yes, it is. And that's why He has to do the work, not we. And that's what makes the burden light. You see, but we have it all wrong. But I say to you, let your security, let your hope, let your decision be on God's truth. And let, let your fear of men be taken away because of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be so I pray. Amen.